I don't know if you've ever tried to figure out the chronology of Jesus' comings and goings after he rose from the dead, but it can be a bit tricky putting the Gospels together. Now, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what are called the Synoptic Gospels, they share about 80% of their material. So, for instance, most of the parables that we find in one, we're also going to find in the others. It's always been the Gospel of John that's a bit of an outlier, giving us about 80% new information that the other Gospels haven't told us. But when it comes to the events which follow Jesus' resurrection from the dead, no, two gosp- no Gospel is like the others. They're all unique in how they explain the details. And I want to take just a few minutes this morning and kind of pool the resources of the four Gospels as we think about Jesus moving among his disciples after his resurrection from the dead. So Jesus was resurrected in the early morning hours on the first day of the week. And that's not as straightforward as it may seem because the Roman Empire of Jesus' day did not observe a seven-day week. The seven-day week would not become part of the official Roman calendar until the reign of Constantine in the fourth century, so hundreds of years later. The Roman week in Jesus' day was eight days. So to say that he was raised on the first day of the week can be a confusing claim all by itself. Was he raised on the first day of a Roman week? Or the first day of the week according to the religious calendar of Judaism? Well, the Gospels seem to suggest that Jesus' resurrection was on the first day of the week on the Jewish calendar, which is why we celebrate on Sunday as we do today. All of the Gospels indicate that several of Jesus' female followers came to the tomb early on the first day of the week. How early did they come? Well, that's difficult to say, too. Putting the Gospel recollections together, it sounds as though they left before dawn and they arrived just after the sun had risen. And Jesus' body was not there when they arrived. So as I said earlier in the service, when did Jesus rise from the dead? We don't know. We only know that he rose before they arrived, because when they came, his body was gone. In all of the Gospel accounts, one of Jesus' followers, named Mary Magdalene, came to the tomb that morning. She's never been called a prostitute in the Scriptures, despite Dan Brown and all of that stuff. Um, The Gospels tell us that she had come to follow Jesus after he had cast seven demons out of her. And she was not alone. Putting the Gospel accounts together, she was accompanied by Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and Salome. So was Jesus' mother Mary there? Well, that's not clear. She would have been in mourning, so it's possible that she would not have gone. However, Mary, the mother of James, could have been Jesus' mother, depending on which James we're talking about. Jesus had a brother named James. Was it that James? However, Jesus also had a disciple named James. Was it his mother? That detail's unclear. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus appeared to the women as they were hurrying off to deliver the message given by an angel to Jesus' disciples. And in Matthew, Jesus reiterated the angel's message when he met with them that he would meet his disciples in Galilee. Did you notice that detail? We recall that they had been in Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, And Passover in Jesus' day was a combination of two festivals, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and together the festivals were seven days long, after which most pilgrims to Jerusalem would have gone back to their homes. Jesus appears, at least in the text we read today in Matthew, to have encouraged his disciples to return home to Galilee after the festivals were complete and that he would meet them there. That's also the way the Gospel of Mark tells the story. However, the Gospel of Luke says something slightly different. In Luke, we're told that Jesus appeared to his disciples in Jerusalem on the same day that he was resurrected from the dead. On that occasion, according to Luke, Jesus appeared to them suddenly while they were huddled together in a locked room. He invited them to touch his body to confirm that he was not a ghost, but was in fact flesh and blood. He ate fish with them. And Luke has continued his recollection as follows. This is from Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 53. 
I want you to notice some of the differences from what we read in Matthew. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is Jesus. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. So from Luke's recounting, it almost sounds as though Jesus appeared to them in Jerusalem the day that he was resurrected from the dead, and then, after leading them out of the city, proceeded immediately to ascend into the heavens. And that sounds different than Matthew's account. And then the Gospel of John adds a few additional details. John confirms Luke's recollection that Jesus did indeed appear to his disciples on the very day he was resurrected. In that way, his account is very similar to Luke's. However, John reveals that the first time Jesus appeared to them, his disciple Thomas was not present. And so Thomas did not believe in Jesus' resurrection because he didn't see him. Then a week later... Jesus appeared to them again, and this time Thomas was with them, and Jesus invited Thomas, some of you remember the account, to touch the wounds in his hands and in his side to see that Jesus was truly raised bodily from the dead and wasn't spiritual or something. John then joins the recollection of Matthew and Mark and tells us that the disciples did in fact go back to Galilee after the Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, and that they returned to their former career of fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and John tells us that Jesus appeared to them there as well. When they returned from fishing, they had not caught any fish. Jesus was on the beach and encouraged them to recast their nets on a particular side of the boat. And when they did, they caught more fish than they could haul in. It's probably one of my favorite scenes of Jesus appearing to them. They knew it was Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat and kind of swims and runs to Jesus. But he's so slow in doing so, the boat gets there before Peter does, which is a great... Um, detail. And when they arrived on the beach, Jesus was cooking fish over a fire, and he offered to cook some of the fish that they had brought in from their catch, and he offered to serve them breakfast. It's a great scene. Then returning to Matthew's gospel, Matthew recounts that the disciples eventually went to a mountain in Galilee that they, Jesus had told them in advance to go to, and it was there that they received what we often today call the Great Commission, the command to make disciples as they went out sharing Jesus' gospel among the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Can these accounts be reconciled? <laughs> There's a lot of details, right? Well, it seems to me that the historical chronology would sound something like this. Jesus rose from the dead before dawn on the first day of the week according to the Jewish calendar. The first to witness his resurrection were the women who came to the tomb to finish the anointing of his body, which had been left undone because of the haste of his burial. Jesus appeared to these women and spoke to them together, but as they separated and went back to where they were headed, he also later appeared to Mary Magdalene. Jesus appeared that same day at least twice. In the first, he joined two of his disciples who were leaving Jerusalem, and he spoke with them. In the second, he appeared to 11 of his disciples who were still in hiding in Jerusalem. Thomas was not with them. The disciples remained in Jerusalem for a week after Jesus rose from the dead, probably due to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus appeared to them at the end of that week on the following Sunday, and Thomas was with them on that occasion, and he witnessed Jesus in the flesh. After the Feast of Unleavened Bread was completed, the disciples returned to Galilee to wait for Jesus to appear to them there. While in Galilee, Jesus appeared to them at least twice, once on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and once on a designated but unnamed mountain. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. They seemed to have arrived there several days before the feast began. It was then that Jesus led them out to the Mount of Olives, and it was there that they saw Jesus ascend into the heavens. That was the last time any of the disciples, with the exception of John, would interact with Jesus bodily, though Jesus would appear some years later to the Apostle Paul. Since that time, our only direct communication with Jesus has been through the Holy Spirit, who was sent to Jesus' followers during the festival of Pentecost that very year. 
So that's history. I know, well, I didn't come here for a lecture. Well, why go through all of that? I have two reasons for recollecting all of that. First, this survey illustrates that the historical recollections of Jesus' disciples were just that. They were historical. If the story of Jesus were invented, the chronology of events would certainly be smoother <laughs> and easier to reconcile. But historical recollections are like this. If you share stories with your family over Easter dinner today, you'll each remember your story slightly differently. And then as you share them, they might come to some harmony, but oftentimes you'll end with disagreement. The Gospels read more like that, more like eyewitness testimony than they do like an invented story. And that's important for us to recognize. But I, what I'd really like to highlight this morning, and I'm not sure with all that I was saying, if it was so apparent, is the waiting. All the waiting. Do you see all the waiting? The book of Acts has told us the following. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Jesus appeared to them at various times over the course of 40 days following his resurrection. But there were so many gaps between his appearances. He appeared to them early on Sunday morning, and then again that Sunday evening, then a week later on the next Sunday, and then however many days later on the Sea of Galilee after they had returned to Galilee, then however long later on a designated mountain, which appears to be the only scheduled meeting of all of them where Jesus told them where he would be, then again in Jerusalem just prior to Pentecost, the Gospels recount over the course of those 40 days only eight encounters with Jesus. And they seem to have all been very brief. Only the apostles Paul and John would ever encounter Jesus bodily after those 40 days. There is one additional detail that's not in the Gospels that's been delivered to us by the apostle Paul. In the epistle of 1 Corinthians, Paul confessed that on one occasion, Jesus appeared bodily to 500 of his followers at one time. And that could perhaps be a ninth encounter. And yet notice all the waiting. Jesus was not at their beck and call. He came and he went as he saw fit. And his disciples were often in the Gospels just left waiting for him to show up the next time. When we read the scriptures, we can sometimes fall into the belief that in the past, God was always speaking and acting in history. And that things were very, very busy. But the scriptures actually insist that direct communications with God have always been rare. And they've always been widely dispersed. The story of Abraham, for instance, spans a hundred years. And in the course of that 100 years, Genesis recounts only 11 direct communications from God over the course of a hundred years. That's pretty sparse. The Bible also tells us that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt and let this settle on you for 450 years. I mean, America is 247 years old. 450 years they were slaves in Egypt, and those are lost years in the Bible. We don't have any story of prophets. We don't have any story of visitations from God. We don't have stories of any kind of communication whatsoever. And just prior to the birth of John the Baptist in the New Testament, God had not sent a prophet to the people of Israel in somewhere around 400 years. So compared to the experience of ancient Israel, God was really active during the 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, right? But even in that period of heightened divine activity, there was a lot of waiting. Why? Well, it's for our discipleship that he makes us wait. It's for our discipleship that God makes us wait. Throughout the history preserved for us in the Christian Bible, each time God has visited a human being or a group of human beings in an obvious and objectively verifiable way, every time he does that, and it's rare, God has spoken words of instruction. God never just shows up and hangs out. When God shows up, he is always talking. And this was even true in creation. Genesis tells us that on each of the days of creation, God spoke commands into creation. Let there be light. Let there be an expanse between the waters 
Let there be seas, let there be vegetation, let there be sun, moon, and stars, let there be creatures in the skies and seas, let there be creatures on the earth, and let there be human beings. And each time God spoke those words into creation, he has then stepped back and allowed creation to respond to his word. Science tells us that these were very long gaps from speaking to fulfillment. The same is true with humanity. When God appears, God speaks word of instruction into human experience, and then God steps back and he gives humanity space to consider, to respond, to deliberate, and to experiment with putting into practice what God has said. And this was certainly the experience of the disciples of Jesus. According to the Gospels, Jesus told them both to meet him on a mountain in Galilee and not to leave the city of Jerusalem. You try and figure out how to obey that. How are you going to do both things? I'm surprised they didn't split up. And then after all of this, Jesus stepped back and he let them figure out how to obey what he had told them. So they stayed in Jerusalem until he appeared to them. But then they went to Galilee to wait for him. And then after he appeared to them in Galilee, they returned to Jerusalem, waited for the fulfillment of his promise to clothe them with power on high. So that's how they worked it out. Jesus gave them specific teachings, but he also left them with room to deliberate as to how to live them out faithfully. The book of Acts chronicles the difficulty that this practice of God caused the early church during its initial decades after Pentecost. Acts is nothing more than the church trying to figure out how in the world to live out the teachings of Jesus in the context of the Roman Empire while they were being persecuted. And Acts, some, they, they make good decisions and bad decisions. Why does God do this? Why not just come and just tell us everything he wants every single day so that we're never without doubt? The answer is discipleship. God's interested in making disciples. Disciples are those who learn not only what to do, but when and why to do the things they've been taught. Disciples are those who can be trusted to make decisions on their own that will be consistent with the ethics and the values taught to them by their mentor. If God did not step back, we would remain children. Children are expected only to do what they're told, but God is not seeking children. God is making disciples. And disciples have to be left to solve the puzzle of the teachings of God and the immediate demands of their lives on their own. We must figure it out. Throughout history, God has visited his people overtly. Those are rare, but they've happened throughout history. And when he has come, he's evaluated our efforts to obey and our creative solutions to difficult problems. And he's advised us in what ways we've pleased him, and in what ways we have not. Humanity is always, when God arrives, in the position of Cain and Abel, with God evaluating the worthiness of our sacrifices. And when he comes, some are Cain, and God is disappointed, and some are Abel, and God is pleased. This is what happens when God visits us. Sometimes God does this personally, as he did with Abraham, with Moses, with the Israelites at Mount Sinai, and with first century Judaism in the person of Jesus. But more commonly, God sends messengers in the form of prophets to declare his words of evaluation, warning, and correction. Those who live in between God's visitations, which have we, as we've seen is the majority of the time and can be centuries long, are responsible to wrestle together to embody the teachings of God in their time. Those living during seasons of God's visitation or his overt activity are responsible to receive God's encouragements and corrections and to change direction accordingly. When God comes, we get our grades and our assignments. You and I were born in a season between God's visitations, but we're now entering a season in which God is acting overtly. While the disciples were waiting for Jesus, they were first hiding, they were later fishing, and then they were later worshiping in the temple. They were living their lives, attempting to live out what Jesus had told them. But each time Jesus appeared to them personally, they stopped, they listened, 
and they took their next steps in light of what he said. When God seems silent, he's testing our maturation and discipleship. When God is speaking, he's testing our submissiveness and our willingness to be corrected. The modern world has risen during a season of God's silence. If God speaks, whether through his word, through a prophet, or right out of the heavens himself, you and I are called to listen carefully and to change direction accordingly. If God is silent, then you and I are being tested to see how we will apply his teachings to our lives. In seasons of waiting for Jesus to speak, we must wrestle to apply his teachings to our lives, knowing that God is testing us and that he will evaluate our work at the next moment he comes to directly communicate with us. In seasons of chastisement by Jesus, we must wrestle to receive his correction and change direction accordingly. The people of his day would not do this. And it's for that reason that they killed him. And he has been crucified once for all, but crucified in many generations that did not want to hear his correction. We must have ears to hear and we must know our season. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.